if you were with me on the last Paul G Alive, or if you looked at one of the clips, you will recognize high school teacher Jenny on screen right now. If you want to see the Jenny saga from the beginning, just tap on the link that is above my head. We started her series on seven reasons why we can trust the Bible. And she is teaching this as a instructional lesson to her high school students, hopefully, presumably at some kind of private Christian school. I'm assuming that no public school would let her get away with this. Anyhow, she's been posting on TikTok her regular daily lesson plans, and we at Apology Alive are going to follow along with her, with her lesson plans, and see if she can convince us, along with her high school class, why we should treat the Bible as historically reliable. So last time we had the introduction in part one, what Jenny then did was actually she redid reason number one, or this is an addendum to reason number one, which if you recall, was for the Bible tells me so. Literally, reason number one is the Bible says it's the word of God, so it must be. Anyway, let's take a look at her addendum to part one. Talking through seven reasons why you can trust the Bible by Erwin Lutzer with my Bible class that I teach at a Christian school. The first reason is we can know that the Bible is the authentic word of God because it says that it is. If the Bible... You think I was exaggerating, but no. The Bible, we can trust the Bible because it says that it's God's word. Every book that says that it's God's word, we should just trust it, right? Because that's, oh, that's evidence. Is the defendant on trial, we have to give it an opportunity to speak for itself. Screen. That's fair. If you are examining a document and the validity of a document, if you don't have the writer, if you don't know who the writer is, the writer's past, you do let the document speak for itself in order to put forth propositions about what the document represents. But you also do then look for corroboration. So for example, a birth certificate, puts forth propositions about a person's name and a person's parents and where they lived, all these kind of things. And you do look beyond the document as best you can for corroboration. For example, is the document in the style of or, or with the unique markings of the kind of birth certificates that they give out in the time and place that is purported to be? There are things you can look at like that, but you would actually at least read the document and see what it says. That's fair and see how it stands up to scrutiny. Not give it zero scrutiny, though. Chat right here, these claims from the Old Testament that are thus saith the Lord or the Lord says statements. Okay, so I think she may have mentioned this last time. She put out a list of verses on there where in the Old Testament, there's a verse that says there's some statement X and it says thus saith the Lord. Now, that is not evidence that the document that records those things is the word of the Lord. Even if you change that, say thus saith Julius Caesar, or thus say apologia. You can quote someone in a document and that doc document not be written by that person. I can quote Einstein. I can quote C.S. Lewis. I can quote anybody in a book. And that doesn't mean that that book is written by those people or endorsed by those people or represents anything that those people did, even if I'm accurately quoting them. So a handful of times where it says, thus saith the Lord is first of all, just the claim. It doesn't mean that the Lord endorses the book. And even if they're accurately quoting what an actual Lord actually said out loud. Again, I hope it's obvious to everyone that does not infer in any way that the documents that are recording that accurate statement is written by or inspired by the person who made the quote. I mean, that's just, really? So we can see in the Old Testament where prophets were speaking for God, the distinguishing characteristic of a prophet is not that they're speaking their words, but the very words of God. Okay, so a distinguishing words of the prophet is that they were really a prophet? Like, no, like, Pro there are, there's a reason why you would at least, when you say false prophets, and I think Christians would agree that in all eras there have been false prophets, we still call them prophets because prophets is a category of people who claim to be speaking for God, right? And then you later need to figure out via some method, whatever method you decide is good for you, I would say predictive power would be a good one, whether or not they are a true prophet or a false prophet, but just the fact that a book records prophecy does not, uh, again, these are stretch claims. These are not, therefore, God is inspired this book. You could have true prophecy in a book that God doesn't endorse. So try again, Jenny. Yeah, and so, and so one example would be like the prophet Muhammad, right? The, pro the Quran is filled with things that the prophet Muhammad said. Then you would say, well, he's a false prophet. Well, that, that, that's fine, but you would need to demonstrate that. But it, if there was anything that's true, that wouldn't mean that you accept that the Quran is the word of God you'd have other explanations for it. So just put yourself for one second outside the mind of someone who already thinks that it's true. Here are some examples, screenshot this list, of where a prophet was speaking for God, and so they spoke in the first person. In Acts 4... 
Yeah. Speaking in the first person is something that a liar or someone mistaken can absolutely do. I probably have in my life, in fact, proclaimed that God told me that God wants X, Y, or Z, and that I could have put it even in the first person. God, told, God said to me, I want you to go and give money to that person and give them a sandwich, which is actually a thing that I felt in my life that God was telling me to do. And I would have said, I would have expressed it in that first person. That does not mean that's what God actually said. It just means that's what I'm claiming. God said, this is weird, Jenny. Or verse 25, the apostles quoted David's psalm in Psalm 2. And they said, who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, your servant said. They said. Okay, so the New Testament quotes the Old Testament and says that the Old Testament is inspired by God. Therefore, the New Testament is inspired by God. No, that doesn't work. You wouldn't say that that works when the Quran takes parts of the Old Testament and, and uses that. You wouldn't say that when the Book of Mormon takes parts of the New Testament and the Old Testament, calls them divine. That does not lend the divine attribution up to the New Testament. Christians are upset when the Book of Mormon does that, but they don't seem to understand why Jewish people would be upset when Christians appropriate their book and want to take any evidence of divinity in their book and steal it for themselves. This is, you can't just put your book adjacent to a book that may or may not be holy and call yours equally holy because it's adjacent or because it quotes it. Again, if I write a book about why the resurrection is false and I include extensive quotes in the Old Testament, divinity of the Old Testament doesn't make my book divine. This is Jenny. Said that when David was speaking, uh. the Holy Spirit was speaking through him. There are also many claims in the New Testament. Again, that's just so, we're just claim upon claim. So I'm, I'm quoting this and... According to whoever the author was, we don't even know whoever the author was. I'm saying that the things that I'm quoting were the words of God. So therefore it has to be like use an outsider test for this. Estimate that it is of divine origin. God spoke directly out of heaven at least three times during Christ's earthly ministry. The baptism of Jesus, the transfiguration, and when Christ groaned in agony in John chapter 12 verses 27. Okay, so my holy book contains three times where God spoke audibly out loud in a way that could be heard. Therefore, my book is from God. Again, we've gone over this, but no, these authors could be entirely correctly quoting verbatim what a voice from heaven said out loud to crowds and that book still not be divinely inspired and or correct in anything else that it says. There, there could easily have been, I mean, and I don't, obviously I don't go that far. I do not think that there ever was a voice saying something to the crowds, but even if I grant your premises, it doesn't conclude what you want it to conclude. Enough said? I think it's enough said. Through 28, and God approved of the crucifixion. Then we've got the writer's claims of the New Testament. Paul off This will be the weakest, right? What the writers claim about themselves. A any writer can claim anything they want about themselves. It, we have to use other statements to corroborate their claims, not take the propositions at the face value. Third, at least 13 books of the New Testament. She just said there, sorry, I interrupted. Paul, she said that Paul wrote at least 13 books of the New Testament. Sorry, Jenny, no. Paul wrote at least seven, I would say, books of the New Testament, but those are what we call the undisputed letters of Paul, because among people who've spent enough of their lives to study these for their opinion to matter much, there seems to be pretty much unanimous, even among people who don't think Jesus existed, I tend to think that Paul wrote these core seven books of the Bible, but 13, no, no. There's, it's too long to get into, but look into it yourself if you're at all a skeptic, if you at all want to really know if the Bible is true. You at least need to look at the claims as to why we don't think that most of the New Testament books were written by those listed in the table of contents. And he received direct revelation from God and God told him what to say. In I'm going to let that, let that go. So Paul actually does claim to have received visions from God and that God was inspiring what he was saying to the extent that he was saying that no man actually had influence of what I'm saying. This is all entirely what I get in my visionary communes with God when we go up into the third heaven and we have chats about these things. However, Paul also, in a few places, does say, he does put in parentheses like things like, these are my words, not God's. Now, I'm trying to think of exact references for that, but there, but are, and I think if you were said, hey, this is divine words, at least you'd have to say, hey, well, if Paul is taking some of his words out and saying, ah, oh, these are my opinion and not God's words, that at least those parts aren't divinely inspired, like that you should take them at face value and say where Paul says that this is just my opinion, man. But anyway, go from there. Scripture. Here is a list of those claims. Then we've got Peter, who makes a direct link between the words that he was preaching and the words of the Old Testament. So first of all, that is assuming that Peter 
wrote any books of the Bible, which most people don't accept. So there's references in First and Second Peter that are two things that didn't exist while Peter was still alive. If we are to accept that Peter died around 64 or 65 at the hands of Emperor Nero, or at least at his command, First and Second Peter were clearly written after 70 AD, possibly much, much after. And also Peter didn't, as best as we can tell, didn't speak Greek. He didn't actually, wasn't able to write in any language if we take Acts at its word, because Acts specifically says of Peter and John, these are unschooled, ordinary men. And in the Greek, the unschooled means don't know their letters. So Peter wouldn't have had time to spend the decades learning how to write in a language he didn't speak in the brief period before he died to write letters that reference things after he died. So no, Peter didn't write First and Second Peter. I will at some point make videos extensively about that evidence, but no, Jenny. Of course, John received revelations, which comprise the book of Revelation. And that is true. The book of Revelation does claim to be a revelation. I will grant her that. There's a reason, though, that it was the last book to enter canon, and there was definitely much dispute and debate about whether it should be in canon, even to this day. And we don't actually know that the John at Patmos was any of the Johns who are allegedly to have written any other books of John. So, but fine, I'll grant your revelation if you want that revelation claims to be a revelation. The other books don't. I understand that for Peter, Paul, and James to have made these claims would have been sheer madness. Unless Sheer madness. She's a fan of the C.S. Lewis liar, lunatic, or lord. The only explanation that we can have is they were straight up lying, that it's true, or they were lunatics. They were mentally ill. I think Jenny may have... Now, most people have subtly backtracked that to say, well, they were mistaken. That's more charitable than saying they were mentally ill. But again, leaving off the table, the legend option, which is that the things that said weren't actually true or they, we have no firsthand account that Peter or James make any of the claims that you want to put into their mouths. We just don't, even if you accept the authorship of Peter and James, they don't talk about these appearances. They don't talk about all these things. You got a long way to go here, Jenny, Peter, this martyr narrative, if you watched my other channel has gone through extensively, but even then all it marks is their sincerity not the accuracy. Of course, they were in fact speaking the words of God. All of And again, they could have act God didn't need to be involved with what they wrote. Even though I'm going to grant you all those things, that doesn't get me to this book is historically accurate, therefore God was involved because there are many books that are historically accurate and God didn't need to be directly involved with any of them. These guys went to their death clinging to their claims. People often citation needed is the best way to put that. We as far as we know None of the handful of people that we know were martyred didn't have a chance to recant as best we can tell. So we have no idea if they would have saved their lives by recanting if they were op given an option. Maybe they would. Anyway, you guys know my stat stance on martyrdom. It doesn't guarantee anything. Die because they are deceived. But deceivers don't die for their schemes. Arguably, John Smith did. And there are others in history who, you know, have let themselves be killed with their lies. Koresh, for example, there's like some people do let themselves go down with a ship that you would say is not based on truth. There are 1,500 either direct or indirect claims that the Bible is of divine origin. What is an indirect claim that, that a book is of divine origin? Also, again, we'll need to go back to the fact that these are 66, if you go to the Protestant Bible, different documents, each of which needs to be evaluated on their own as to whether it's divine. Christians will back, scholars will, Christian scholars will back me up on this. You should not be treating the Bible as a big homogenous book. It was written by many, many authors over long periods of time. So each of the inclusions need to be evaluated on their own. Origin within scripture. 66 books of the Bible speak with a consistent oh, you know. voice okay. that these are the words of God. And I do not buy this consistent narrative part of the 66 books. I read the books and they seem to be all over the map in terms of what their message is. The trick is the New Testament authors, whether they were divinely inspired or not, we're deliberately taking sections of the Old Testament and deliberately drawing parallels. Now, someone like me looks at that and says, did that parallel event actually happen or are they just extrapolating it? But let's even give them the benefit of the doubt that it did happen. We know that the writers of the New Testament were deliberately trying to harmonize what they were saying with the Old Testament. So it is not super impressive that they achieved it, much in the way that if someone is writing a sequel to a movie. So let's say Top Gun Maverick that was written so many years after the first Top Gun. The fact that it makes a coherent story is unsurprising because they wanted us to feel like it was a coherent story. So 
Don't see how this is an argument for divinity. If the writers are lying, this is the most fraudulent book ever written. What and I don't know too many people. Well, maybe some people do. I don't say that all the authors were lying. I think the authors thought that they were telling the truth from a certain point of view. I think that some of them knew that they were being hyperbolic. For example, the portents in Matthew, I think it's 26, maybe 25, where, you know, with curtains tearing and the moon and the sun going black and people rising from the dead, you know, like there, there can be exaggerations, hyperbole in the books. There can be just rough historical knowledge that they believe is true, even if it, they don't have a correct basis for it. We are not looking, we don't have to look at these things as entirely lying or entirely true. There are shades of gray in between. Wouldn't it be so crazy that the book that has inspired the highest standard of morality would be based on deception? The okay, I think I'm going to take exception that the Bible is the book that demonstrates the highest standard of morality. It seems to allow for a lot of harm in the world. It seems to, I mean, classic examples of genocide and slavery, and it has inspired things like the Crusades and modern day violence against people of the LGBTQ plus community. There's no end to examples where the Bible inspires immoral behavior, directly inspires. So I would say, frankly, that like Jainism has higher moral standards than the Bible does. Or I would even argue like the book of Satan is a better moral standard. Or frankly, I think most versions of secular humanism are better moral standards than the Bible. So you're not gonna you're not gonna get me to concede on that one, Jenny. Good luck. Book that I place my hand in when I am swearing that I am telling the truth would be based on multiple deceptions. That's what we call ironic. That is a product of popularity, not on a product of and act frankly, on the perceived consequences of violating it. So we're not trading on you don't put your hand in the Bible because the Bible's true, you're putting your hand on the Bible because you're acknowledging that you're willing for an all-powerful being to smite you, because that is the claims in there, if you are wrong. You're not putting your hand on there affirming that what's in there is correct. God has signed every single page of the Bible, Lutzer says, and his signature is not forged. All right. Well, I when I read Song of Solomon, I don't see how every single page is signed by God. And frankly, when I read a lot of the New Testament, I don't see how each page is signed by God. This signature of God, what what does it look like? How do we know? This is until then, basically you're just telling me you're a big fan of his work. God has spoken and left us his word and he has told us so. More on this in the next video. Okay, next video. I'm lesson planning for what I'm gonna teach in Bible class this week as I'm going through this. Erwin Lutzer's seven reasons why you can trust the Bible. Reason number two is a historical reason, the reliability of the Bible as it relates to archaeological discoveries. There are many Ooh. skeptics who would claim. Archaeology, everybody. Reason number two, she has on screen their reason to a historical reason. No, she's talking about archaeology. Archaeology and history are not synonymous, by the way. Archaeology is finding artifacts and determining things about how humans lived. So in that sense, it's, just, it's historical, but history and archaeology are different points of study, just for reference. That there was no Moses, no crossing of the Red Sea, no revelation on Mount Sinai. We I agree. None of those things are evidence to have happened or exist. Can't even be sure that Abraham existed. Should we? Nope. We can't be sure that Abraham existed. Sorry. Much like the previous video where the woman was like, well, I'm sorry, but testimony is not very good. And then you say, how convenient. Well, okay. I know it's convenient, but it's not very good close our eyes to what scholars say, hoping that their claims just evaporate if the... So uh, what you say, what you're saying there is, you know, should we close our eyes to the scholars who doubt this stuff? Lest my interruptions may have disrupted her flow of thought there. So she's wanting to know if her students should just close their eyes to scholarship. Bible were entirely off base and inconsistent with what we know from Middle Eastern history. If it spoke of mythological cities and scrambled historical timelines, and if these things could be established by independent historical research, then we would have to humbly admit that the Bible is unreliable from cover to cover. So here's the thing about that. She wants to say, if the Bible spoke of places that didn't exist, mythological cities, as one of her claims, we'll go to the events claim separately, then we could disprove the Bible. The problem is the Bible is not falsifiable on these criteria. And in archaeology, you would never be able to say such and such a city didn't exist, right? You couldn't. What you would say is we currently don't have archaeological evidence for, like, say, Nazareth, right? 
For a long time, they hadn't discovered any place that claimed to be Nazareth. So skeptics were right in saying, hey, we have yet to discover a place called Nazareth. Eventually one, one was found, but, but at no point in time was that like a falsification criteria for the Bible. And finding it didn't affirm that the, the events were correct. Not having it didn't disconfirm. So you'd need to have a falsification criteria in order for what Jenny's proposing. And unfortunately, they don't put one forth. So for example, right now, we don't know where Arimathea is. If there was a Joseph of Arimathea who took Jesus' body, where is Arimathea? Well, I'm not running around saying, we don't know where that city is yet, therefore the Bible's false, and nor would a Christian accept that. You know, again, so one of the things archaeology would need to do if it's, it's supposed to be this proof, not disproof, is creating falsification criteria. Now, on these events, though, she was talking about, can they have scrambled events in the Bible? Many historians slash archaeologists do think that there are scrambled events, and there's why it's he hotly debated, even amongst people who believe the Exodus happened. When did it happen, and what is most convinced in line with the evidence we have? And none of the proposed dates work exactly right for the archaeological evidence. Now, has that has the fact that both positions has detractors and archaeological evidence against it? Has that has any Christian thrown up their hands and said, "No, this can't be true"? No, it's like well, no, we don't yet understand how it fits. Now, someone like me looks at it and says, "Yeah." This is disconfirming. Like, for example, this global flood. I think we have plenty of evidence that disconfirms that. And a lot of these, a lot of these things, I do think there is. But in order, this is again similar to that video before, where the person was shouting about medical records as the standard of evidence. Jenny wants something disconfirming on a non-false. I'm repeating myself, but I'll do it anyway. On a non-falsification criteria, you're looking for falsification. That's just not the way history works. History is a probability thing, and I mean, I may as well throw it in now. Spider-Man analogy slash Spider-Man fallacy, depending on who you talk to, the fact that a piece of literature or a piece of history gets names of cities or names of people correct doesn't lend authentication to the events that it purports to have happened. So Spider-Man takes place in New York. Spider-Man in the comics met Barack Obama. Spider-Man has been to a number of places in New York that you can verify and go and visit yourself. That does not mean that there is a kid named Peter Parker who is bit by a radioactive spider and therefore can crawl up on walls. Affirming details doesn't affirm the events that are purported. That's just, that's common sense. Either it is what it says it is, God's word, or the entire thing is fraudulent. But Ooh, it's either entirely true or it's entirely fraudulent. Where have I heard that? Sorry. That's a side thing and that's a different discussion for another day, another time. It's just fun to hear Jenny say that. The majority of archaeological finds have confirmed biblical records. You didn't say that all of the archaeological finds have confirmed the Bible. You said the majority, but the sentence before that was it's either entirely true or entirely false. So if there was one archaeological that didn't support it, which is inferred when you said majority, so is it entirely false? A list of the discoveries would be so long, it would have to shut the mouth of every single critic. And yet it hasn't. And yet the list of archaeological affirmations has yet to shut the mouths of critics. Why is that? Every single month, new archaeological discoveries are made. They are recorded in the Journal of Biblical Archaeological Review. And they are... Ooh, they are... Every month, they are recorded in the Journal of Biblical Archaeological Review. Why do you need Biblical Archaeological Review? Why are these... If these are so affirming, why are they not just in Archaeological Review? Why are they unconvincing to people who don't already affirm the Bible? You'd think they're so strong that you could just publish these archaeo... It's not controversial for example when you, you when you dig up a city it's not like there's secular scholars and secular papers saying are going to deny that you found a city or found an artifact no they might they might not agree with you on your attribution but they will let you publish all your finds why aren't these in the secular review journals why is there a separate one for biblical finds is it perhaps that they don't have the same rigorous standards is it perhaps that they are excluding data that doesn't affirm their conclusion Seems suspicious. Are chock full of these reports in every single issue. Given the Bible's excellent reliability over the long haul, it would be doubtful that there could ever be one singular archaeological discovery that would disprove the validity of Scripture. That's exactly what I was saying. No one has put forth falsification criteria, archaeological or otherwise, for the Bible. So you can't point to the non existence of finding the falsification criteria that you haven't put forth as your victory lap, as your win. You didn't, you haven't found the thing that we haven't put forth yet, so we win. Like, that doesn't make sense. First, you have to put forth something falsifiable. Understand that my faith is not dependent on an archaeologist digging another 
confirmation up from the ground. I understand that. It is clear to me that your faith does not rise or fall on discovery of evidence. But it is encouraging to have so much evidence. Bernard Graham wrote for Time magazine in an article entitled, Atheists Can't Wait to Prove the Whole Thing is a Fairy Tale. Mm, a quote from an article who writes a hyperbolic title like that is sure to be insightful and helpful for our discussion here. And he said this, A thousand times over, the death knell of the Bible has been sounded, the funeral procession formed, the inscription cut out on the tombstone, and the committal read, but somehow the corpse never stays put. No other book has been so chopped, sliced, sifted, scrutinized, and vilified. What book on philosophy or religion or psychology or Bell's letters of classical or modern times has been subject to such a mass attack as the Bible, with such venom and skepticism, with such thoroughness and erudition? Upon every chapter, line, and tenet, the Bible is still loved by millions and studied by millions. And Lutzer follows. So, in essence, what they're saying is that because the Bible is in their view, the most attacked book in the world, that should serve as some kind of evidence. And we can dispute whether or not that's true. If you could show that the Bible was the most attacked book in the world, that therefore it must be divine, right? Because only, only a divine book could be the most attacked. Whatever the second most attacked book is, that doesn't need to be divine for some reason. But once you get to certain levels of attackedness, divinity. This is the same point I was quibbling with Jay Warner Wallace about with his, his person of interest book where he wants to say that whatever the most popular one or whatever the most referenced was or the whatever one is held by the most people, the only way to explain something being most popular is that it's divine. And that's just ridiculous. Something was most popular before. The most influential person in history before Jesus came didn't need to be divine. So this, it does not follow. It does not follow. By saying, perhaps the reason for the Bible's longevity can be found not in the men who wrote it, but in the God who inspired it. Isaiah. Or perhaps the longevity is can be attributed not to those who wrote it or to who inspired it, but the utility of it. The Bible has been an incredibly useful book for many for 2,000 years. Whether it's true or not, it has utility. So maybe that, along with popularity, along with social cohesion, is why it's endured so long. Food for thought. 40 verse 8 says, The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. No other historical document is met with such skepticism. Other ancient manuscripts are usually accepted at face value, but the... No, that is, I keep hearing that. Absolutely not. Historical documents are not accepted at face value. A priori, right? We, historical documents are taken claim by claim, proposition by proposition, in context, and definitely in line with what we know, how it aligns with our other worldviews and how it aligns with other things we can know and establish. Historical documents are not treated in this homologous way. And I'm, it's getting frustrating to hear Christians spout this over and over. Bible is different. Why? Perhaps because... The Bible, the portions of the Bible that make non-mundane claims are treated exactly as we mentioned Herodotus earlier and the, and the Griffins and the gods involved with things. Those portions of his histories are treated with the same skepticism as the supernatural portions of the Bible. There isn't a double standard going on here. As if it is accepted. If it was, if this was the kind of standard we need to accept, then, hey, Christians, do you accept all the supernatural claims of, of Constantine, of Julius Caesar, of all of these other histories that include supernatural claims? Do you accept those on face value? You don't. Or Islam or Book of Mormon. You don't. You just want, you want your book to be in a special category. Said as the word of God, then that means that it has some authority in our lives. I believe that in order to accept the Bible as the true inspired word of God, that we must first come with our hearts. Come. So she used that same phrase last week, come with your hearts, phrasing, cool. But she's admitted it here. In order to accept the Bible as history, you have to come to it first, assuming that it is history. And that's the biggest admission in all of this. If you assume, if you're begging the question, if you assume the conclusion before you even start, then you can find ways to make it fit. What I did when I started to evaluate my faith was, can I establish that it's true not assuming that it's false, nor assuming that it's true, but just letting the evidence speak for itself. And that's where I found it to be wanting. And that's the only way. We all have biases, absolutely. The only way to get past our biases is to identify them and to do our best, not to eliminate them as best we can. We can't entirely, but do our best. Jenny's asking us just to have biases. Come at the Bible 
assuming beforehand that it's true. Full on bias mode. That's how she's advocating her students study the Bible. Down to not a matter of can we know that the Bible is the word of God. It comes down to will we believe. There's none so blind that will not see. Again, you'd have to demonstrate for me is, again, referencing back to that video we spoke of earlier, it's impossible for an outsider to know whether I am coming at the Bible from a position of never affirming that it is true to being a res resistant non-believer, or if I'm coming at it in a non-resistant non-believer fashion. Impossible for anyone to know, but I can know for myself whether I'm lying to everyone or whether I'm being genuine. I can know, and that's, I've lost my train of thought. Jenny's basically p placing this blanket that the only way you can get there is to want to get there and that anyone else is just resistant. That's ridiculous. Do your own research. Fill a notebook with archaeological evidence that the Bible is the word of God. Definitely do your own research. Jenny, it doesn't seem like you have done your own research. It seems like you don't understand the challenges that would be made to the bold claims that you are making. I could be wrong, but it doesn't seem like it. in these sessions, at least I understand TikTok is a short medium. It doesn't seem like you understand them. So yes, I hope your students do their own research, but filling a notebook full of archaeological finds that in one way or another affirm some tertiary details of the Bible does next to nothing to affirm the events that it espouses. So what you need is something of that sort. So again, most archaeologists, most historians are walking around not moved by this archaeological evidence. And as you said earlier, why is that? Are you asking your students to close their eyes to the scholarship? Or do you actually want to dig in and find out why scholarship isn't convinced? It doesn't seem like you do. But I could be wrong. Anyway, this is a series. Stick with me on my next show where we will do part three and maybe part four, depending on how far she is. 